everyone except me, the photos are taken from their home pages. For, for me, it's taken from a party uh, when I was trying to, to do all sorts of funny faces. Uh, the second one, let's see. I, when I was preparing the slides for this talk, I was not aware that my talk was right after lunch. Uh, if I knew, it might have been slightly less technical, but I hope, uh, I, I hope you'll be able to follow anyway. Uh, I, can you hear me? Do I need a mic? Yeah, no. all good. Okay, so, so the topic of the talk is uh, algorithmic graph miners. So, so the graph miners project of Robertson Seymour set out essentially to prove the Wagner conjecture, which they did, but on the way they proved a lot of other cool stuff, and that other cool stuff is useful elsewhere, and pretty much one of these things is what we're going to talk about. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about the excluded grid theorem, or some specific excluded grid theorems, <laughs> and how they can be applied in order to give uh, algorithms for NP-hard problems. Uh, even though this audience probably doesn't need this, uh, H is a minor of G if H can be obtained by G by deleting vertices, deleting edges, and contracting edges, where when you contract an edge, if any double edges arise from that, you make that a single edge, and if you make any loops, you delete the loops. Um, grid, given that we're talking about grid minor theorems, uh, this is a 4 times 4 grid, uh, a 5 times 5 grid, and so on, is defined analogously. Uh, a few facts about tree width. Uh, if you delete vertices, delete edges, and contract edges, then you can never increase tree width. Uh, you will decrease tree width by at most one. Uh, a corollary of the first part of the statement is that if h is a minor of g, then tree width of h is at most the tree width of g. Uh, because h is obtained by, from g by deletions and contractions. Uh, one can show, this is actually surprisingly difficult to show, uh, that the tree width of a t times t grid is t. Uh, so it's at most t, and it is also at least t, so it's, it's exactly t. Uh, from this it follows quite directly that if g does contain a t times t grid minor, then the tree width of g is at least t. Now, the question is, what about the converse of this statement? Uh, if G has large tree width, uh, does it imply that it also contains a large grid minor? Uh, the answer to this question is yes, but no, or, or no, but yes, depending on, on how you want to put it. Um, so first, let's just play a little bit and suppose we don't know anything <coughs> about grid minors other than they are like subgraphs or subsets of in your in your graph, and you ask the following question: Is it possible that the any graph of tree width at least t uh, must contain exactly a t times t grid minor? And you would you would pretty fast uh, conclude that this cannot possibly be the case unless m p is a subset of co m p, uh, because tree width is an m p complete problem and and the large grid miner would be a certificate of tree width being at least, say, something. So, so you will have a certificate of no for an NP-complete problem, and uh, that means that NP would be a subset of co NP, or the other way around. Uh, however, you can ask approximate variants of this question. So if you have tree width 500, does it mean that you do contain a grid of size square root 500? And, and this, of course, has been studied uh, quite thoroughly, as we, for example, saw uh, a talk in the previous session. Uh, here is a much more concrete counterexample than, than trying to appeal to MP versus co -MP. Uh, A clique on t vertices has true with t minus 1 and only a square root t times square root t grid minor, because a t times t grid needs t square vertices to live. So, so in a clique of t vertices, there's only a square root t times square root t grid minor. Uh, and the corresponding conjecture is that there exists some fixed constant, strictly greater, uh, 
strictly less than one, I guess this guy here should be, uh, such that every graph of tree with at least t uh, contains a t to the c times uh, t to the c mine. Uh, this, of course, automatically says that c has to be less than one half. Right? And uh, as far as concrete counterexamples go, I think uh, there is a graph on t log t vertices uh, for which the largest grid minor is square root t times square root t, but nothing bigger is known. So, so, we, so, so it could be that this constant c actually is like 2.1. Uh, as we have seen in the previous session, was that every graph of tree with t uh, contains a fifth, fifth root of log t uh, grid as a minor. And uh, in the previous talk, we saw that it was actually square root of log t. You, you can do slightly better than that. <coughs> uh, of course, there is, there is a huge gap because between what we know uh, and what is conjecture. So, for some classes of graphs, given that this is a graph class uh, <coughs> workshop after all, you can have a much tighter relationship between the grid minor and the tree width. In particular, we will say that a class F has linear grid minors. Uh, if there exists some constant C such that if I have a graph that's in the class, and the true width is at least t, then it contains a c times t times c times t grid minor. The linear grid minor theorem uh, goes as follows. I mean, well, first, let's observe that since cliques uh, don't contain linear size grids, uh, we know that general graphs don't have linear grid minors. We just saw this. However, for h minor free graphs, so if we fix some graph h, and we consider h minor free graphs, uh, then you can show that the class of graphs that exclude h actually do have linear grid minors. The constant c depends on h. Now, I mean, we've seen that this holds, but, but now the question is, why should we care? And I'll try to convince you that one reason we should care is that this seemingly uh, innocent statement allows you to prove a well of algorithms uh, for, for problems on H minor free graphs, or more generally on graph classes that have linear grid minors, and where the only thing we know about the graph class is that it has linear grid minors. Uh, the first observation is that if you have linear grid minors, uh, then you have sublinear tree width. So, so I say that a class has sublinear tree width is if I take a graph G in the class on M vertices, then it has m, then the tree width is at most m to the epsilon for some epsilon less than one. Well, specifically, if you have linear grid minors, uh, then the tree width of any graph on n vertices is at most roughly square root m. And the reason for that is, of course, that uh, t times t grid needs t square vertices. When you have something in your tree width, then you get fast exact exponential time algorithms for many problems. So, so here is one example. Uh, we're going to look at independent set. Uh, so an independent set is a set of pairwise non-adjacent vertices. And uh, the independent set problem goes like this. Uh, I give you a graph, I give you an integer k, and I ask you, is there an independent set in the graph of size at least k? On general graphs, this problem is really, really hard. There, there is no m to the epsilon, so if I give you a polynomial time, I cannot m to the epsilon approximate the size of the largest independent set for any epsilon less than 1, unless p is equal to np. Uh, there is no sub-exponential time algorithm under assuming the exponential time hypothesis, and there is no FPT algorithm assuming that FPT is not equal to w1. Uh, what we're going to talk about here, just a little, just right now, is uh, what happens for independent set on H minor free graphs, and, and specifically what happens uh, for sub-exponential time. So it's quite easy to observe uh, that since uh, if I give you a graph G and I ask you what's the size of the largest independent set, uh, well, since H minor free graphs have sublinear tree widths. 
the tree width of G is at most square root n, or roughly something like that. So we uh, compute the tree decomposition of G, <coughs> and it is known that there is a constant factor approximation of tree width that runs in time poly n times c to the power of the tree width. So, so if the tree width is square root n, then we constant factor approximate tree width in time, say, 2 to the square root n. Okay. Once we have a tree decomposition, uh, we just find the smallest independence at in time 2 to the tree width, such an algorithm is also known, and we end up with the exact algorithm for independence at on h minor 3 graphs that only uses 2 to the square root n. Uh, of course, there was nothing special about independence at in this algorithm. The only thing we used about independence at in this algorithm was that it could be solved in time 2 to the tree weight. So, in particular, any problem that can be solved in time 2 to the tree weight, or say tree weight to the tree weight, or for that matter, even 2 to the little o of tree weight squared, right? Any such problem does have sub exponential time exact algorithms on h minor three. Uh, okay, these are some really simple consequences. So if your graph class has linear grid miners, uh, then you can solve a bunch of problems in some exponential time on them. All right. Uh, these are kind of boring consequences, right? This is somehow even too easy. So, so the question is, is it possible to squeeze out something more from linear grid miners uh, and just linear grid miners? And the question is, yes, we can. <laughs> um, so uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is truly sublinear tree width, which is somehow a combinatorial consequence of linear grid miners, but as we'll see, it also has some uh, nice algorithmic applications. So without further notice, well, let's stare at the definition. Uh, a graph class has truly sublinear tree width. Uh, if for every constant eta, there exists some lambda beta, such that if I, ooh, eta transversal, bad. If I have a set x, such that removing x from g, uh, gives a graph of tree width at most eta, then the tree width of g is less than the tree width of g minus x, which would be eta, plus beta x to the power lambda. Whew! That was uh, a heavy definition after lunch. Let's try to digest it. Uh, if I add k vertices to a graph of constant tree width, where the, that constant is eta, it's going to increase the tree width of my graph but at most beta k to the lambda, uh, where, of course, you have to stay in the class, right? You start, you start in the class, you add some vertices, you stay in the class. The class has truly sublinear tree width if whenever you start with something of constant tree width, you add some vertices to it, then how much did the tree width grow, grow by? It grew by something sublinear in the number of vertices that you added. Uh, let me say a little bit about the intuition of, of, of what this means. So, if, if we don't think about graphs, uh, but instead we think about functions, uh, then sublinear functions look like this, right? Uh, and anything bounded by this guy would also be considered a sublinear function. However, that sublinear function could look like this. Can, can, okay. Uh, which means that, I mean, even though globally it's bounded, locally it can be really, really bad and grow really, really fast. Okay? So when we say that the function is truly sublinear, somehow what we want to capture is that the function behaves like this everywhere. Okay? And the way we formalize it in, in this particular instance for graphs and, and with the function, be, so, so if you think of this guy as the graph and this guy as the tree width, uh, then, then the way we formalize it is that if I take any graph of constant tree width, add some vertices to it, then the tree width grows sublinearly in the number of vertices that we have. So, uh, let me. Which one is it? Right, that one. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay, so <laughs> if you have linear grids, uh, then you have truly sublinear tree width. This is the first non-trivial statement of my talk. Uh, 
So how can we prove this? Still an easy proof. Uh, OK, if f has linear grid miners, take a graph g in the class f, uh, then it contains a delta t, delta t grid miner. Okay. That, now we ask ourselves, well, how many disjoint copies of uh, eta plus 1 times eta plus 1 grid miners does g contain? Well, we just pack eta plus 1, so where eta is some small constant. Right? So we just pack these little grid miners in inside this guy. And the number of guys we can pack is, well, it's th this is the dimension of the grid, so that this is that size squared time divided by the size of the little grid. Right? So it's going to be something like delta three root squared uh, over eta plus one squared, which is some constant, like it's delta squared over eta plus one squared, times the square of the tree width of the graph. But well, if we know that I have graph G, and I pick the set X, and when I remove that set, the tree width becomes at most eta, then that set X had to hit all of those eta plus one times eta plus one grids, because their tree width, after all, is eta plus one. Uh, then I know that the size of X is at least gamma tree width squared, right? Because I need I needed to hit each of these little guys. Well, so that means uh, that we are done, right? I mean, if I added, so if I start with a graph of constant tree width, let's say eta, and when I went up to something of tree width t, then the size of the set which I added had to be quadratic in the resulting tree width. Okay. So uh, if your class has linear grid miners, then it has truly sublinear tree width. Uh, one thing that you should notice is that somehow the if my original intuition about what truly sublinear tree width means is something like this, right? Uh, and then you look at the definition, the definition looked somewhat complicated. I mean, we said something like, for every constant eta, there exists a lambda and a beta, such that when I add x vertices to a graph of tree with eta, some stuff happens. Something that would have been much more natural would be to say that a graph has truly sublinear tree widths if adding, say, k vertices to any graph will increase the tree width by at most square root k. Right? This would be a, a natural definition of truly sublinear tree width. However, it is not very productive uh, because then this theorem wouldn't hold. Uh, and the reason this theorem wouldn't hold is that, uh, let's see, if I have, if I have a k over 2 times k grid and I have another k over 2 times k grid, the tree width of this thing is, is k over 2, then, then I add k vertices to it, and tree width doubles. Right? And this I can do for any k, so I mean, if this somehow more natural definition of truly something here, tree width turns out to be not too useful, which is why we, we changed the definition to, to be slightly less intuitive. <coughs> uh, an interesting question is, if a graph class has truly sublinear tree width, and suppose it is closed under induced subgraphs, so deleting vertices keeps you in the class, uh, if you have a hereditary graph class with truly sublinear tree width, does it mean that you have linear or at least subquadratic grid miners? Uh, this is a nice question. I have to admit that I haven't thought about it very, very much, but uh, if this turns out to be true, it will be quite cute. Uh, what is known, this was observed by Daniel Marx, was that if I have a graph class that is subgraph closed, and it has truly sublinear tree width, then it is actually minor closed. Okay? Then it actually excludes some minor. Uh, well, it's not minor closed, but it excludes a minor. Uh, and, and then it will automatically imply that you have uh, linear grid miners. But uh, in, in some sense, that implies that uh, the that linear grid miners, like the graph classes with linear grid miners, uh, if they are not H minor free graphs, then they should not be closed under subgraphs if, if they are to be an interesting port 
of that concept. <coughs> okay, uh, here's a question. Suppose a graph class has sublinear tree width. Does it mean that it has truly sublinear tree width? Uh, here, there, there are examples of hereditary graph classes that do have sublinear tree width, but don't have truly sublinear tree width. And, and, and here is a simple example. Uh, if I take cliques, uh, but such that every edge of a k clique must have been subdivided at least k times. Okay? And then I take induced subgraphs of those. So then I get a hereditary graph class, definitely. And if I uh, have a graph of tree with t, that means that I started out with a t clique or some, something larger than a t clique, and that means that I have at least t squared vertices because I actually need all, all of the edges inside there. Uh, so, so the point is that this guy here has sublinear tree width, uh, but it doesn't have truly sublinear tree width because if I give you all the edges of the clique, but none of the vertices, then this has tree width 1, but once I add k vertices to it, it becomes tree width k. So uh, this is de definitely a different notion. Uh, I introduced a notion to you, uh, but the question was, well, as we started to go back, was why should we care? Right? I mean, okay, uh, is the notion interesting by itself, or, or does it give you anything? Uh, it turns out that it gives you something. So uh, when you start looking at algorithms on H minor three graphs, or, or more generally on uh, graph classes that do have linear grid pointers. So what is more dimensionality? It's a, it's a framework introduced around 2005 uh, that gives sub exponential FPT algorithms uh, approximation schemes, which are really good approximation algorithms, and linear kernels for problems on H minor free graphs. Uh, and the cool thing, let's see, so let, let me, before I tell you what the cool thing is, let me explain the terminology. An FPT, a sub exponential FPT algorithm, uh, would be an algorithm that runs in time 2 to the little of k times poly m, where k is some parameter, typically the solution size. Uh, an approximation scheme would be a 1 plus epsilon approximation that runs at f of epsilon uh, poly m time. Sometimes uh, the f of epsilon is up here, but usually it's down here. A linear kernel would be a polynomial time algorithm that reduces the instance size to something that is linear in your parameter, say solution size. Uh, a cool thing about bidimensionality is that it's based solely on linear included, excluded grid maps. The only thing this, all of this stuff does, uses uh, is that H minor free graphs have linear excluded grid maps. <coughs> so if you actually look back in the old papers, so, so if you look at for example, the domain Hajagai paper from SOTA 2005 that, that does approximation schemes. This is actually not quite true because at that time we didn't really know that H minor free graphs have linear green miners. So, so they had to do a bunch of other things. But looking back at what they were doing and reformulating it, uh, what, what, among the other things that we were able to do here was to show that it only depends on having linear grid miners. And what it does is that it gives you a promise of portability, right? If you have some graph class that's not H minor free, but it happens to have linear grid miners, uh, then, then you can obtain some of these things uh, for that, or all of these things for that graph. Uh, what we're going to talk about right now is we're actually going to talk about how linear grid miners, or sketch to some degree, how linear grid miners uh, give you some exponential FPT algorithms and approximation schemes uh, on the graph class considered. Before I do that, I need to tell you what bidimensionality is. Right? I need to tell you what the bidimensional problem is. Um, so graph problem is bidimensional uh, if the optimal solution has size or value approximately t squared, like c times t squared, uh, on t times t grids. And the problem is minor closed. So what does it mean the problem is minor closed? The value of the optimum can only decrease as I take minors of my graph. Uh, to the, to, in order to be able to 
talk about this formally, we're going to define graph optimization problems. Uh, we'll input as a graph. I'm looking for some set S that is minimizing or maximizing some optimization function, <coughs> and it satisfies some constraint. So, so I'm looking for some vertex red set that uh, optimizes the corrective function, satisfies a, constra a constraint, and what we're going to say is that the value of the optimal solution on G is going to be pi of G. Uh, a formal definition of bidimensionality now is a problem is bidimensional if it satisfies the following two properties. The first one is that if H is a minor of G, then the value of the optimum on H is less than or equal to the value of the optimum on G. Uh, and the second one is that there exists some constant such that the value of the optimum on the t times t grid is at least c times t squared. Okay? Uh, let's look at one problem that we all know and love, namely feedback vertex set. Feedback vertex set uh, in the graph is a set such that deleting this set from the graph leaves an acyclic graph or a force. Uh, the problem is, given a graph, an integer k does G contain a feedback vertex set of size at most k? An obvious observation is that feedback vertex set is neither closed, right? If I take an acyclic graph and I remove vertices, remove edges, or contract edges, then that is still acyclic, uh, which means that the size of my solution when I do this cannot increase. Uh, also, if I give you a t times t grid, I can pack four cycles in it, just like, like I showed. And then each of these four cycles need to contain at least one vertex from my feedback vertex set. Uh, which means that the value of the optimum on the t times t grid <coughs> is at least t squared over 4. Which implies that feedback vertex set is bidimensional. And for, for many other problems, for example, let's say cycle packing, you can, you can prove similar things and prove that these problems are bidimensional as well. Uh, now, we're going to give you uh, some exponential time parameterized algorithms for all bidimensional problems on graph classes that do have linear grid markers. Uh, how we're going to do this is almost the same way as we gave the exact exponential time algorithms. So if I give you a bidimensional problem on a graph class with linear grid miners, uh, then I know that the tree width of the graph is at most square root of the value of the optimum. Uh, let me prove the lemma. Well, if tree width was at least t, for some t, uh, then I would have contained at least a delta t times delta t grid minor because the problem is bidimensional. Oh, sorry, because uh, the class has linear grid miners. Right? On that grid minor, uh, the value of the optimum would have been at least alpha t square because the problem is bidimensional. And because the problem is closed on taking minors, we know that p of g is at least alpha t squared as well. Right? So if the value of the optimum is quadratic in the tree width, then the tree width has to be square root of the optimum. Uh, some exponential time algorithm, so some exponential time parameterized algorithm, is exactly the same algorithm that we did for, uh, as for the exact algorithm case. Uh, what do we do? Well, you constant factor approximate tree width in time 2 to the tree width, which is like square root opt. And then you solve it in 2 to the tree width time, which is 2 to the square root opt time. So very simple sub-exponential time algorithm for all bidimensional problems on graph classes that have linear grid miners. Now, let's look at something that gets more complicated. Uh, suppose we want to approximate these problems as good as we can. Still on graph classes where you have linear grid miners. Uh, here's the theorem. If I have a bidimensional separable and reducible problem, whatever that means, uh, then it admits an EPTAS on every graph class with linear excluded grids. Uh, so an EPTAS is this 1 plus epsilon approximation in f of epsilon poly n time. Uh, examples of problems that satisfy these bidimensionality and these two mystical words are vertex cover, say feedback vertex set, uh, deleting the minimum number of vertices to get to an outer planar graph, or say cycle packing. Uh,
unfortunately, just tree width square root of oft is not quite enough. Uh, so we need to define something called separable. Uh, I'll actually define this formally because I have to. Uh, I will never talk really formally about what reducible means, but uh, what we're going to prove is that if you have such a problem, then you have a very nice decomposition. And what reducible is going to do is it's going to allow us to use that decomposition. Somehow in a similar manner as what we said that the problem has to be solvable in C to the tree width time in order to have a sub-exponential algorithm. Okay? So, so think of reducible as that. What separable is, I'll, I'll tell you right now. So we say that a problem is separable um, if, I, if whenever I give you a partition of the graph into a left part, a separator, and a right part, uh, such that there are no edges from the left part to the right part. Right? S is a separator, left, separator, right? Uh, then the following, uh, and I give you an optimal solution to the problem, uh, then the following three inequalities are satisfied. Uh, so let's look at the first one. Uh, if I look at the optimum solution uh, on just the graph induced by the left-hand side, then that's going to be at most uh, what the intersection of the is going to be at most the intersection of the optimal solution that I gave you to the entire graph with the left hand side plus the correction term which is roughly the size of the separator. Uh, the same thing should hold on the right hand side. And, and finally I give it, it has you need the following thing that um, the value of the optimal solution uh, does not behave really crazily when you remove a separator from the graph. Uh, if you think of the value of the optimal solution always as the size of the optimal solution, you, you lose a few problems, such as cycle packing. Uh, but then it's much easier to follow what these guys, what these inequalities say. Uh, in particular, what it, what it would say then is that if I look at, so, so if I look at the value of the optimal solution's intersection with the left-hand side, uh, plus the value of the optimal solution's intersection with the right-hand side, it should be at most my original value of the optimal solution plus order separator correction. Uh, let's look at an example to see how you would prove that something is separable. Uh, for example, feedback vertex. So if I give you a separation of a graph uh, into left, separator, and right, and I have some optimal feedback vertex set in my entire graph. If I remove a separator from the separator from the middle of the graph and I look at the intersection of the feedback vertex set on the left side and the right side, well then this is still a feedback vertex set of the left side, and this is still a feedback vertex set of the right side, uh, which then means that <laughs> the value of the optimal solution on the left hand side is at most the value of L intersection opt, right? We don't even need the correction term. The same thing holds on the right-hand side. And, and finally, if I look at the, the intersection with the left-hand side plus the intersection of the right-hand side, well, then it's at most the size of the set originally anyway. So a feedback vertex set is, in fact, separable. And you can, you can, in fact, prove for a bunch of other problems that they are separable as well. Here's a theorem. And that is that every bidimensional separable and reducible problem admits an EP task, so it has an approximation scale on any graph class with linear exclusions. Uh, so for a quite wide range of problems, you are, without even knowing what they are, you're able to get approximation schemes uh, on any graph class where the only thing you know about the graph class is that it has linear excluded fruits. The approach works like this. I find the decomposition of my graph into two pieces. Uh, where one piece has is small. It has at most epsilon times opt vertices. And the other side uh, of the graph has tree width at most g of epsilon, where I can choose epsilon to be anything I want. So the important thing is that the tree width of the graph, uh, when I remove this set, is going to be some constant. Of course, what we can do then is that we can take the top part and you sacrifice it. And then you solve the problem optimally on the constant tree width. And that's it. Uh, what reducibility is, is a formalization of the fact that you can actually sacrifice 
these epsilon opt vertices, and that for a solution of your nuance, like on, on your instance on this graph, you can actually take it back to a solution of your original graph, right? That's what reducibility is. So, so, so something I, I find very nice about this approach is that most of you might have written a paper about graph modification problems, where, where you have uh, you, you have a, some few vertices, uh, and you want to re remove as few of them as possible in order to get to a graph class. At least I have a few papers like that. And then in the introduction, I always uh, end up writing something like, oh, we might have some heuristics or approximation algorithms that sacrifice this set and solve the problem optimally on the graph class. Or uh, you solve the problem optimally on the graph class, and the running time is only slightly worse than, than your original running time. And, and it's nice to see at least one concrete example where, where we actually do exactly that. Um, okay. What we need to do in order to implement such an approach is a, comp is a constructive decomposition theorem. So it's a decomposition theorem which actually gives you this. So on one side, I need to tell you that this always exists, and on the other side, I need to tell you that we can always find it. Uh, how can we do this? So first, let's formalize what this thing here is. So I'll say that an eta transversal is a set uh, S such that removing it from the graph leaves a graph of true with at most eta. Uh, what we're able to prove is that if I have a bidimensional and separable problem uh, on a class with linear excluded grid miners, then there exists some constant eta such that G has an eta transversal of size order opt. Okay? Compare this to our plan. Uh, we need an epsilon opt here. What this guy gives us is order opt, and it is existential. Right? So what this theorem gives us is that if I give you some uh, problem that's bidimensional and separable on a graph class, uh, then there exists some constant and a set of size order of such that removing this set leaves a graph of constant uh, It's not quite good enough for, for what we're trying to do, but then we can show the following. Uh, if you have truly sublinear tree width, which after all graphs with linear excluded grids do have, uh, then there exists some function that takes natural numbers and real numbers outputs. Real numbers could be naturals, for that matter. Uh, with the following property, if I give you a graph class, so sorry, if I give you a graph in the class, and I give you a set uh, such that removing this set uh, leaves a graph of constant tree width, then I can take this set and I can scale it down to an epsilon fraction of, this, of its size, uh, such that removing this smaller set still leaves a graph of constant tree width, where the constant may blow up, but it only blows up as a function of the scale down in the size of the set. So what was the property? Uh, there is some function, such that if I give you an eta transversal, then for every epsilon, I can find the set x prime of size of most epsilon x, such that x prime Deleting x prime from the graph leaves a graph of constant tree width. <coughs> and x prime can actually be computed from g and x in polynomial. So if I have a transversal of size order opt, I can actually get the transversal of size epsilon opt, but for a larger but still constant tree width. Okay. So suppose I want to implement my plan uh, that I told you about earlier. Uh, we know that there exists an eta transversal. Uh, of size order opt. Uh, if we could find such an eta transversal, then we could scale it down to some eta prime transversal of size epsilon opt, and then we could sacrifice and solve, just as before. The only problem is that we cannot find any set x of size order opt, we just know that it exists. However, if we had a constant factor approximation for the eta transversal problem, we would be done, because then we would actually find a set x of order opt just for a different constant in the big O. Uh, what we know about this problem for general graphs is that you have a square, you have log to the 3 over 2 opt approximation, uh, and that's the best known, which unfortunately isn't quite good enough for us. However, if your graph class has truly sublinear tree width, then there is a constant factor approximation with the caveat that it runs in time 
and to the f of eta. So as long as this guy is a constant, it's polynomial time, but the, the running time explodes as, as eta goes bigger. So these are the three pieces in our, in, in our algorithms. And that's pretty much it. This is how, it, how we can make it work. So, so here's a scheme of how we can get, if I have a problem uh, on, say, an h minor free graph pass, if the problem is bidimensional, separable, and reducible, then we're going to see how to get an epithet, epithet. If it's h minor free, then it has linear grid minors, right? If the graph class is h minor free, then we have linear grid minors. If a graph class has linear grid minors and it's bidimensional, then we have the parameter tree width bound. So we know that tree width is at most square root of all. Uh, using the parameter tree with bound and that the problem is separable, we can prove that there exists an eta transversal of size order of it. Uh, the fact that if we have linear grid miners gives us truly sublinear tree width, which gives us the scaling part, <laughs> that we can scale an eta transversal down to an, some eta prime transversal, which is much smaller. This thing can then be used to give a constant factor approximation. Uh, which in terms allows us to find an eta transversal of size order opt, which we then can scale down to size epsilon opt, which then gives us the epitos. Okay. Uh, and of course, if I'm considering a problem on a graph class where we don't really know, I mean, which satisfies only part of these things, but we know that the problem in the graph class satisfies a cut in this graph. Right? Dependency graph. Then we can still conclude the EP pass. Right? Uh, so for many problems where we weren't actually able to apply this machinery directly, we were able to observe that, hey, but this problem like has or this graph class has truly sublinear tree width and it satisfies some things here. But uh, I'm not going to talk about that. So a quick recap that we gave some EP tasks for bidimensional problems on classes that have linear grid miners. This works on h minor free graphs, but this is quite old. I mean, okay, quite old. It's like a year or two old. Um, the question is, can I promise you that the fact that the only thing we used about these things were that it, they are linear grid miners, uh, that could give us some portability. Now, the question is, can we actually apply this elsewhere? Again, the answer is yes, we can. Uh, so in order to see where we can apply this, we're going to go to geometric graphs. Uh, this is a paper from next year, uh, <laughs> but it is already on archive. Uh, is that we can use linear excluded grids to give epitasses and sub-exponential FPT algorithms on map graphs and on unit disk graphs. So in the remainder of the talk, I'm going to talk about just unit disk graphs and only epitasses on that, and not sub-exponential <laughs> algorithms on map graphs or sub-exponential algorithm on, on, on unit disk graphs. So, so this is the part I'm going to focus on in the rest of this time. <coughs> so what are unit disk graphs? Well, vertices are unit disks, and you have an edge between two unit disks in the plane if the two disks overlap. So here is a collection of disks, and this is the corresponding graph. Okay? So what does it mean that the disk is unit? It means that all the disks have radius one. Uh, alternatively, vertices are points, and I have an edge between two points if the distance is at most one. Well, I mean, if these guys had radius 1, then the, the edge should be if the distance was at most 2. But <coughs> this is the definition I'm going to use, because we can, of course, just scale down the picture as much as we like. So the vertices are points in the plane, and you have an edge between two points if the distance is at most 1. Uh, an interesting thing about graph problems, when you restrict the input to be unit disk, is that usually these problems remain NP-hard. But they're often easier to approximate, and they have faster exact and parameterized algorithms, which is somehow an interesting picture because when you see something like that, you might want to think, oh, maybe you can apply something bidimensional here. Um, however, these algorithms are often very geometric in nature. These algorithms really use the model that these are unit disks in the plane. So even though this is, this is a graph workshop, I'm going to give you something a, a, a very geometric argument, this is not our argument, this is quite old. We'll give you a polynomial time approximation scheme for an independent set on unit disk graphs. 
Okay, so suppose I give you a bunch of points in the plane, and I want to approximate the independence of problem. What I'm going to do is I'll partition my plane into slivers of width 1, and I'll label these slivers into 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, where the number 4 is chosen arbitrarily. I could have numbered up to 100 if I wanted to. Okay? Now, the width of the slivers is exactly 1, and I put these lines, vertical lines, in the plane so that they don't hit any points. Okay? I, I can always do this. Uh, and then, two points that are here and points that are here are too far apart to have an edge between each other. Okay? What we know is that if I pick some number, let's say 3, and I look at all the numbers, uh, so if I look at all the slivers number 3, then at most a fraction 1 over 4 of the solution is going to appear inside here for at least one of the numbers, 1, 2, 3, or 4, right? Just by averaging arguments. So now, uh, if we remove all of the points in this slivers from the graph, uh, and then we do the same thing vertically, so again I just put slivers and a number from 1 to 4, 1 to 4, 1 to 4, and remove these guys, I have the total amount I have removed is at most a fraction 1 half of the optimal solution, if I had chosen the number here to be up to 100 instead, I would remove at most 100 fractions of the solution with these guys and 100 fractions of the solution with these guys. So I only removed a small constant fraction of the solution. And the nice thing is that inside here, we would have connected components. So, so there would be no edges from such a guy to anyone else. So we could solve the independence of problem independently on each of them. The additional property these connected components would have is they, I mean, they will have some additional structure that will allow us to solve the independence of that problem in polynomial time on them. In particular, if I look at such a guy, and inside of this grid, I superimpose a new grid with, uh, with sides 1 half times 1 half instead of 1 times 1, then I know that inside every little square, any two points are of distance less than 1 between each other. So all of these guys correspond to cliques, right? Which means that an independent set inside this uh, connected component has size at most 36, which means I can brute force this connected component in time n to the 36, where the 36 is just the, the number of slivers minus 1 squared, right? which gives us the epitas. Or the pitas, sorry. Uh, so, so what did we see? Well, we saw a very geometric approximation scheme for an independent set on unit disk graphs. Uh, this is what we're talking about, it's called the shifting technique. So the shifting technique, it, it works for a few other problems, such as, for example, dominating set or vertex cover. But the important thing was, that had to be there in order for the shifting technique to work is that the problems are very local in nature, right? Like the, what happens to one vertex only affects his neighbors, right? But what happens for a feedback vertex set, which is much more non-local, where you remove one vertex and you're killing cycles that, that span out through the entire graph? Or cycle packing, so, so what is the cycle packing problem? I give you a graph G, integer K, and I ask you, can I pack K vertex destroyed cycles in the graph? Okay. Well, using the shifting technique here looks difficult. Can we do something else? Well, we're going to apply the machinery that I've talked about all this time. If unit disk graphs had linear grid miners, then we would already be done, right? And there would be no point in talking about what I'm talking uh, about this anyway. I mean, if we have linear grid miners, uh, then all of the stuff that I talked about would still be valid and we would have EP tasses already. However, unit disk graphs don't have linear grid miners because they contain cliques. And cliques don't contain grids of linear size inside of them. However, cliques are the only bad case. This is the funny thing. Uh, what we can show is that if I take a unit disk graph and it doesn't contain any clique of size gamma, and it has true with at least t, then it contains a t over 21,600 gamma cubed times t over 21,000 gamma cubed grid mine. In particular, for fixed values of gamma, it means that unit disk graphs that don't contain a clique of size gamma have linear grid lines. Uh, 
which are in turn directly inclines, the feedback vertex set and cycle planking and all of these bidimensional problems actually have epitaxes on the unit disk graphs with no such cleats. So, uh, in order to get approximation schemes on unit disk graphs, what we need to do, we just need to clean the cliques. We just need to get rid of the cliques in some efficient way. Uh, one thing that I would like to say is that we prove a theorem pretty much like this for map graphs as well, which means that the algorithms we're going to talk about for unit disk graphs pretty much transfer to, to map graphs as well. Not quite, but I'm not going to talk about that. Let's look at feedback vertices. Uh, if I have a clique, in my graph G, uh, then any feedback vertex set in G has to contain at least C minus two vertices of C. Because if I leave three vertices in a clique, well, then I leave a triangle. And then my feedback vertex set wouldn't have been the feedback vertex. So here's an algorithm. Based on epsilon, uh, I pick some number T, namely two times one plus epsilon over epsilon. And if I find the clique of this size, uh, then I take the entire clique, I put it into the solution, and I proceed with the graph minus that clique. That's it. Uh, how does this affect my approximation ratio? Well, let's just see what happens clique by clique. Right? Uh, we know, so let opt prime be the value of the optimal solution in G minus C, and opt be the optimal solution of my graph G, where when I remove the clique C, I removed at least C minus two vertices from the optimal solution, which means that opt prime is at most opt minus C plus two. Uh, actually, I do some inequalities, but the important thing is, suppose you're removing a clique of size 100. That means that the optimal solution contains at least 98 vertices from that clique, whereas you are paying 100. So every time you pay 100, optimal solution would have paid at least 98, and you were controlling the 100 versus 98. You could have chosen 1,000 versus 998 instead. So this can get an arbitrarily good approximation. So here's a p-test for feedback vertex out in unit test graphs. Clean all clicks of, of uh, large enough size, and apply the p-test we already showed you. That's it. Uh, so, what does this tell us? Well, for any problem that was bidimensional and separable, and blah, 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 so that it had actually approximation schemes or problems with linear grid miners, these things transfer as long as we can clean the cliques. Cleaning cliques turns out to be often easy, but sometimes not that easy. Here is the last example. Uh, what about cycle planking? Well, if I have a graph G and I remove some clique C, or just some vertex set from G, then I'm going to destroy at most C cycles, quite clearly. Um, and if I have a clique, then I can pack C over three cycles entirely inside of it. This gives me a simple three approximation. Right? If I find a clique of size 300, or actually if I find a triangle, I pick this triangle and remove it from the graph, well, I gained one cycle, but I lost at most three cycles from the optimal solution. So this percolates with a, uh, with a factor three, and then afterwards, I have a triangle free graph, so I definitely have a p-task. So, so this gives me a simple three approximation. Now the question is, can I get the p-task for cycle packing on unit disk graph? Uh, well, here's a lemma. If I have a unit disk graph and a clique, then there is some optimal cycle packing such that at most 810 cycles of the packing use exactly one or exactly two vertices from Z. Okay? Uh, notice that the in the optimal cycle packing, every cycle uses at most three vertices from C because like, if, if you have four vertices from the clique, then you definitely contain a triangle of that cycle, so you can just like, use that triangle instead. So uh, suppose we prove the lemma, right? How can we give it p-tas? Well, uh, if we find the clique of size 3x for some large enough x, then we're going to pack triangles in C and remove C from the graph. Uh, we're going to make x cycles in C, and by the lemma, we're destroying at most x plus 810 cycles in C. Because uh, at most 810 cycles use one or two vertices. In and uh, the approximation factor for this operation is going to be x plus 810 over x, 
And we're controlling x, so we can make this arbitrarily close to 1. So uh, let's prove the lemma. Here's a simple observation. If I give you a clique and a unit this graphs, then I take the neighborhood of the clique, and that can be partitioned into 27 cliques. And the way we do that is that if I have a point, then all of the neighborhood is inside a disk of radius 1 around it, and uh, all of the neighborhood of the, so, okay, sorry. So if I have a point in the clique, then the clique has to lie inside this disk, which means that the neighborhood of the clique has to lie inside this disk. So if I partition this grid into some subgrids of size, those squares of size 1 half times 1 half, well, then each of these guys has to be a clique, right? And where? Now that we know this, uh, we'll say that the cycle touches my clique if it contains one or two vertices. So consider an optimal cycling cycle that minimizes the number of, cy of cycles that touch the clique. Um, if you have more than 54 cycles that touch the clique in two vertices, uh, so here we have the clique, and we have three cycles, and we have a bunch of cycles that touch the clique in two vertices, uh, then there has to be three guys, by a pitch and hold principle, who contain at least one more guy uh, in the same clique in the neighborhood of C. But then we can repack these three cycles like this, getting the same number of cycles, but fewer cycles that touch the clique. The same thing you can do if there's too many guys that touch the clique in only one side. I mean, look at the slides later, maybe, if, you, if you're interested in what happens. P-test for cycle packing, if a large clique exists, pack triangles remove the clique. If no large clique exists, we'll use the, the EP-test for linear grids. To wrap up, what did we see? Uh, we saw the composition theorems, approximation schemes for problems uh, on graph classes with linear grid miners, uh, and how to extend these things to unit disk graphs, which don't have linear grid miners, but you can extend it to, say, map graphs as well. Uh, here is a nice list of open problems. Uh, we're not able to clean clicks on map graphs. The click cleaning procedure that, that we showed is very specific to unit disk graphs. Now, nice question, do you have a p-task for cycle tapping in map graphs? Uh, what happens on disk graphs? So, well, we, we can show that if I have disk graphs, which are intersection of disks with arbitrary radius uh, in, in the plane, then you don't have linear excluded grids, uh, even when you don't have any large clicks. Okay, so it's not sufficient to clean clicks. Uh, can you still get EP tassels using R methods or modifications of those on, on this graph? Uh, what about the same questions, but some exponential time parameterized algorithms? In fact, uh, you can clean clicks in some exponential parameterized way. I mean, I, I'm not going to talk about how, but, but you can. So, so all the results I talked about actually extend to sub-exponential parameterized algorithms as well. Uh, so what about sub-exponential parameterized algorithms for these problems on map graphs and, and disk graphs? Uh, two questions. Uh, first, can we use linear grid miners even more places than what we've shown? Well, so, so far, there's only one more example compared to just h minor free graphs. Uh, and here's one of my favorite open problems lately is, is there a simpler and or faster algorithm to recognize map graphs? I have like a minute to talk about that. So, so what is a map graph? So planar graphs, uh, so planar graphs, then I have that, uh, actually, I have regions in the plane that are adjacent if they share an edge, right? So, so I would have a foresight. In the map graph, the regions are adjacent if, even if they share a point. So this would represent the fourth week. Um, so there is a polynomial time algorithm that recognizes map graphs. It runs in time m to the 120. Uh, in the in Fox paper of uh, Mikkel Torp from 1998, uh, of which a journal version has never appeared. Uh, however, there is a full version on the internet. Uh, so so a, a good starting point would be to decipher that. Uh, but I believe, let me make a bold statement, I believe there is a cubic algorithm to, to recognize map graphs. Okay. Um, but uh, that would be a challenge. 
these, this talk is based on three papers, by dimensionality and something. Uh, check them out. Otherwise, thanks. <laughs>